of Chinggang Ji and Jens Harting of the Eindhoven Institute of Technology in the Netherlands. The title of the talk is a Controllable Capillary Assembly of Magnetic Ellipsoidal Janus Particles into Tunable Rings, Chains, and Hexagonal Lattices. And the presenter will be Ching Kang Chi. Yes, thank you. So I'll share my, share my, you, can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna do the full screen mode. So you see it now in full screen mode? Yes. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'm Qing Guang. Uh, so today my talk will be about the, the assembly of magnetic ellipsoidal Janus particles at a fluid, fluid interface. I will show you the particle can assemble into different structures. You have a brief introduction. The, uh, the colloidal particles strongly attach at a fluid, fluid interface, and the particles can deform the interface that's generating capillary interactions. The capillary, capillary interaction will drive the particle to assemble into specific structures. So the, uh, so the, the assembly of particles provide a bottom-up approach to fabricate functional materials. However, there's a great challenge to actively control the particles to assemble into desirable structures. If you look into the nature, some animals, they can uh, control the capillary force to move, to move their body. Here I show a bit of lava. This, uh, this, this inside cannot walk on the water. However, it can deform the interface by arching its back. That's generating a capillary force, pushing it up the meniscus. I also will play a movie to show the progress. Yeah, so, but uh, we know the colloidal particles are dyed. The colloidal particles deform the interface due to it, their intrinsic properties such as gravity or an astropic shape. So the question is, can we also actively control the interface deformation around the particle? Thus, we can also control the capillary interactions between the particles. I consider a specific, uh, uh, I consider uh, one kind of uh, colloidal particles is special. So I consider this elisoidal Janus particles. Here I see, I, I show the one particle is attached at the, at the fluid, fluid interface. The two hemi elisoids of the particle has, have opposite vertical ability. So the polar part has a kind of angle 90 degree minus beta, we, we can call it a hydrophilic part. And the polar part has a kind of angle 90 degree plus beta. We can see this is a hydrophobic part. And the, the, the boundary between these two hemi ellipsoids is uh, called the Janus boundary. And the particle has, uh, has a magnetic dipole moment directed perpendicular to the Janus boundary. And then we can also apply external magnetic fields to rotate the particle. When the particle uh, align tilted orientation, the particle will deform the interface. And also we define a dipole field strength in this way to uh, character characterize the uh, interaction strength between the mag magnetic dipole and the external fields. Also, I also we define the free energy as a summation of the surface tension uh, times the contact area. So we see for the upper right orientation state, the free energy consists of three parts. So fluid, fluid interface, and fluid one with a polar part, and fluid two with a polar part. When the particle align in tilted orientation, the free energy consists of five parts. So the fluid, fluid one, fluid two interface, and the fluid one with a polar and with polar part, and fluid two with a polar part, fluid two is also a polar part. So, the, so, uh, but it's very difficult to calculate the free energy of the system because it is very difficult difficult to model the the deformed interface, also to calculate the segment area of the ellipsoid. So we perform computer simulations to investigate the system. I use uh, a, a light boson method to simulate the fluid as a Shenzhen multi-component model. 
multi component model used in our in our simulation, and the solid particles are discretized on the fluid so fluid lattice, and uh, the fluid and solid particles are coupled through a momentum transfer method, so they are strong coupling. I will not go into details of the method. I will show you the results. So f first, this is the. <coughs> So this is the torque on the particle. When I rotate the particle, then I can measure the torque on the particle. So you see here the torque as a function of tilt angle. Uh, here I have five data sites. If you can see the, if you can see the green, red, black symbols, they they are for the ellipsoid young particles with different amphiphilicity, with different beta angle. So we see if this torque, the behavior of the torque is very complex. At zero kind of angle, at zero to the angle, the torque are, the torques are zero. This means the upper right orientation is uh, stable, is a maintain stable stable state for the particle. And if uh, the torque will increase lin almost linearly with increasing to the angle, around 30 degree and uh, when we increase the tilt angle further, the torque will decrease following by a sharp increasing to, to the to the tilt angle around 120 degree, then the torque will drop to zero at the uh, tilt angle 180 degree. Also, I show you the torque for the spherical Yano's particles. We see the alpha x2, one beta x21, this is for the spherical particle. For the spherical Yano's particle, the torque increases for small to the angle, then reach then reach the constant value. Also, I show you the data for a uh, homogeneous ellipsoid particle. The torque will decrease, then increase, and followed also by decreasing to zero. And then I combine the torque for spherical particle and the torque for ellipsoid particle, then I get a qualitative behavior as a torque on ellipsoid or Young's particle. So this means the this ellipsoid Young particle, uh, it's uh, like a, a, there's an interplay between Young's property and the ellipsoid, ellipsoid property. The Young's property wants to keep the particle staying upright on tension, and the ellipsoid property wants to uh, force the particle to align parallel to the interface. And then I integrate this torque. Uh, I integrate the torque along the tilt angle, then get a friendly difference between the, between the tilt angle and the, the in, and the initial uh, configuration, the, so the upright configuration. Then I see, for, so in the figure on the right, I show the free energy and function of tilt angle. So we see for smaller beta angle, so that, that means the Yano's property is weak. Then we see the there is a global energy minimum when the particle line around 80, 80 degrees. So the particle at the tilted orientation is the global minimum configuration. When we increase the beta angle, we found the, the particle at upper right orientation is the global energy minimum configuration. So this gives us idea uh, if we put a particle on the interface, the particle will take upper right orientation or will take a tilt orientation. Here I show you a movie. Uh, one rotate, one ro one rotate the particle. You see how the interface deforms around the particle. So you see the interface uh, deformation of the varies with varying the tilt angle. Here you see a strong dipolar shape. Then I have three snapshots to show like typical deforma interface deformation on the, around the particle. When the particle lying in 80 degree, we see the interface deform around the particle in a hexapolar shape. So you see we, we see three sizes rise and three uh, three dips around the particle. When the particle lying in 90 degree, we see the a dipolar interface deformation is formed around the particle. So at one side of the particle, the interface is raised up, and at the other side of the particle, the interface is de depressed. If we increase further to the angle, we see the interface deformation become even stronger. So this, so we found that the particle can generate hexapolar or dipolar deformation at 
different tilt angle. This gives us an opportunity to generate also different capillary interactions, and uh, and we can also use a particle to assemble into different structures. Here I will show you. Uh, so if we have multiple particles at the interface, which structure will the particle form? In this case, I randomly distribute the particles at the interface, and I s now I switch off the magnetic field. I will place move it to show you the process of the assembly. You will see we see here some small clusters are formed. You see here the three particles they align tip tip, and then also two particles align side to side. So there are there there is a coexist of a side to side alignment and tip to tip alignment. And also, I, in the in the figure on the left, I show the interface deform around the particle in hexapolar shape. So in this case, the particle can uh, can rotate along the z axis. The particle can move in the x and y direction. So in this case, the particle forms small clusters. And then now I, uh, in this case, I apply one horizontal. Magnetic field and also upward magnetic field. In this case, the particle will be the particle are forced to align in the direction parallel to the horizontal magnetic field. The interface around the particle deforms in hexapolar shape. Also, then I will also will place move it to show you the process. So in this case, we see the particle they form a zigzag structures. In this case, the particle has only two degrees of freedom. They can only move in x and y direction. They cannot rotate. Yeah, another case. So in this case, I uh, only uh, have one downward magnetic field. In this case, the particle deformed interface in dipolar shape. So from this uh, figure on the left, they also see the red color means the uh, interface is raised up, and the blue color means the interface is depressed down. You see the, uh, so you see the the interface around the particle from dipolar shape. And then this movie shows you the assembly process. The particle form firstly they form some chains. And the chains also are interacting with each other. It's a periodic boundary condition. Yeah, finally they form a ring because it's periodic boundary condition. So they finally they form a big ring. In this case, the particle uh, has three degree of freedom. The particle can rotate along this axis and can move in x y direction. Then. Uh, in this, here I turn on the horizontal fields, the particles are forced to align in the uh, direction parallel to the horizontal field. In this case, the particles only have two degrees of freedom. freedom. They form uh, straight chains in this case. Yeah, the chains also have interactions. Yeah, here I summarize all the structures I, I observed by the, in the simulations. So uh, the first row shows uh, the case with lower particle surface fraction. So the, there are around 30 particles in this case. And in the second row, I show a case with higher particle surface fraction. So there are around 120 particles in this case. And we see the particle can have form small clusters and the ring structure, also chains and the zigzag structure, and if I uh, apply one very strong upward magnetic field, the particle align in upright orientation, then there's no interface information around them, the particle align more randomly. For the higher surface, uh, for the higher particle surface fraction case, we see the, we see for, for the figure G, the rings are more curved in this case, so this is, Basically, the geometric uh, rigid restriction, restriction. The particle have no enough space to form circular rings, so they are pressed by pressed by each other. They form some 
begin to curve. Also for the chain structure in figure H, we see also some chains are curved. This is also similarly due to geometric restriction. And for a figure in figure I, we see the particles they form regular hexagonal lattices. So we we so we found that the particles they can assemble into clusters, rings, chains, hexagonal lattices with varying the magnetic field. Then I, I then we run extensive simulation to construct this fit diagram of the structures at the functional upward field and horizontal field. So uh, so basically we see for if the fields are very vague, the particles they will align in disorder the structure of the particles are more randomly distributed on the, at the interface. If we have one strong upward field, the particle also the particle also will will be more randomly distributed on the at the interface. When the magnetic field is downward when there is a strong downward magnetic field. The particles they will form ring structures, and if the horizontal field is very strong, and the field is the upper the magnetic field in the vertical direction is downward, then we get we get the chain structures. And also finally, if we have a strong horizontal field and the vertical field is upwards, then we get uh, hexagonal lattices. This can give uh, uh, like industrial experiments to form different structures with ellipsoidal particles by adjusting the magnet magnetic fields. And then here I'll show you the transition of assembled structures by varying the direction of the fields. Firstly, the particle particles are randomly distributed at the interface. Let's turn on the fields. See they form hexagonal lattice. I switch the fields, the structure also re, re, the particle re, re, rearrange and from chains in this case. Then again, I switch the fields, the particle from rings. Also, some rings are broken and some rings are reconnected. Then I turn off the fields, so the, the structure are relaxed. And then uh, with the upward field, the particles are more randomly distributed in the interface. Then I estimate the time scale of the transition and how fast the particle structure can translate between each other. So I normalize the time with surface tension and uh, the particle radius and the viscosity. The part, I consider particle I consider particles with radius four micrometer as by ratio equal to three and the particle are at the water decay interface. So I estimate the time scale is around one one millimeter second. Yeah, then I come to conclusion. I show the ellipsoidal young particles gen generate hexapolar or dipolar interface deformation with varying to the angle. And uh, then the inter the capillary interaction between particles are different, then the particles assemble assemble into clusters, ring chains and hexagonal lattices with varying the external and fields. Y yes, thank you. Let's thank our speaker. We have time for um, um, maybe one or two questions. Hi, Tim Kruger is speaking. I have a question. Yes. yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's very um, very nice. I, I like the structure so that are forming. Is it um, in, in your model, do you have particles so that are paramagnetic that uh, don't interact with each other and uh, they don't have a permanent dipole or how can I understand it? Can, can these particles also interact with each other magnetically rather than hydrodynamically? Yeah, they can do. Yeah, they, they, they're, they, I, I, in this case, that we have dipole, there is dipole dipole interaction between the magnetic moments. But we are we are, uh, import very very weak double double interaction. So the dominant interaction is the capillary interactions. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Um, if not, let's thank our speaker again. And. Uh,
we'll go on to the, the second talk. We have two more talks in the session. Uh, the second talk is by uh, Jubati, Kinapi, and Cassiola from University of Rome, Tor Vergata. The title of the talk is EHDPD, Dissipative Particle Dynamics with Ion Transport to Study Electrohydrodynamic Phenomena. The presenter will be Alberto Jubati. Please. Thank you. Uh, Can you see my screen? Yes. So good evening, uh, everybody. I am Alberto Gubbiotti from uh, Sapienza University of Rome. And uh, I will talk about EHDPD, which is uh, dissipative particle dynamics with uh, ion transport to study electrodynamic phenomena. So uh, electrodynamics in uh, nanofluidic system arise from uh, the fact that we have uh, um, ionic species, so electrolyte solutions, and in confined uh, in charged walls and an external electric field. Uh, in this uh, kind of situations, the electric field is coupled with uh, the hydrodynamics. So a very well-known example of this uh, behavior is uh, the electrosmotic flow induced by an external electric field uh, on uh, an electrolyte solution confined in uh, a nanochannel with uh, charged walls. Uh, this uh, kind of uh, problems may be studied with um, a continuum approach, so using, uh, for example, Stokes equations for the fluid dynamic part, uh, Nernst-Planck equations for the evolution of the ionic concentration fields, and uh, Poisson equation for uh, electrostatics. Uh, however, uh, this uh, kind of approach uh, doesn't take into account uh, thermal fluctuations, uh, eventually transported uh, nanoparticles or phase transitions, uh, which may be very important in uh, nanofluidic systems. So the, the aim of uh, this work uh, was to uh, build a coarse-grained model of uh, the electrolyte solution as uh, a modification of the dissipative particle dynamics model. So adding uh, um, additional degrees of freedom, which represent ionic species uh, dissolved uh, in, the, in the system. Uh, the, the model was uh, validated simulating a planar electrosmotic flow. Uh, dissipative particle dynamics uh, uh, models uh, uh, the fluid as a set of particles interacting uh, with the three different uh, forces, a uh, conservative force, a dissipative force which is uh, uh, dependent on the relative velocity uh, of the interacting particles and uh, a stochastic force which is uh, proportional to a white noise uh, uh, process. Uh, the parameters uh, gamma and uh, sigma uh, modulate the intensity of the dissipative and uh, stochastic forces and uh, the weight uh, functions uh, WD and WR uh, are functions which depend only on the a distance between the two interacting particles and have a cutoff such that uh, only nearby particles have an interaction. Um, the dissipative force and the stochastic force are not uh, independent, uh, instead are related uh, via fluctuation dissipation uh, equation. Uh, what uh, we did was to um, start from the dissipative particle dynamics model and add uh, new variables representing the ionic species uh, in solution. And of course, we added also the equation for the dynamics of the new variables. So specifically, uh, in uh, this new framework, the, uh, the mesoparticle has a, a position, a velocity, of course, and also uh, a quantity of cations and anions uh, carried in the mesoparticle. The uh, equations for the dynamics of the two additional uh, variables have uh, a dissipative term and a stochastic term. The stochastic term, again, is uh, proportional to a white noise uh, uh, process, and uh, the dissipative terms are proportional to a difference of uh, chemical potential between the mesoparticles. The uh, next step we did was to... Uh, 
inserted the uh, conservative force and the chemical potential of these mesoparticles in a uh, physically uh, appropriate way. Uh, so we uh, consider the fact that uh, the set of equations is a stochastic uh, set of equations, and so uh, we consider the equation for the evolution of the probability of these uh, uh, variables. Uh, then, uh, assuming the existence of an equilibrium probability distribution, uh, we modeled uh, the uh, equilibrium distribution and then obtained uh, the uh, corresponding results in the original set of equations, which are the conservative force and uh, the chemical potentials. So specifically, uh, we um, consider the uh, set of equations of, uh, uh, of uh, the dynamics as uh, a Langevin equation, uh, in which has uh, the derivative of the vector of state uh, to equal to uh, a component, which is the drift vector, which is uh, deterministic, so it uh, contains all the deterministic terms in the set of equations, plus uh, a, a part which is uh, proportional to a vector of uh, white noise, uh, independent white noise processes, uh, which is the stochastic part of uh, the equation. Uh, using the Langevin framework is uh, useful because uh, uh, it is uh, easy to write the uh, corresponding uh, fokker planck equation for the evolution of the probability density function of the system. And uh, assuming uh, the existence of uh, an equilibrium distribution gives uh, um, a connection between uh, the drift vector U, uh, the matrix G which determines the, uh, the stochastic part of the equation, and uh, the equilibrium uh, distribution. Uh, so, writing uh, the equilibrium distribution as uh, a, an exponential uh, of uh, a function which uh, may be seen as the co coarse grain entropy of this system uh, gives uh, a relation between the diff vector u, the noise matrix g, and uh, the coarse grain entropy. Once uh, substituted back into this uh, equation, the, the terms, uh, uh, the specific terms of uh, the, the system of equation. Uh, we obtain, on one hand, uh, the, some relations between the uh, dissipative terms and the stochastic terms, which are the fluctuation dissipation uh, uh, relations. Two of them are the same as in uh, uh, standard DPD, and the other two arise from the new uh, variables. And on the other hand, we obtain uh, a relation between the uh, conservative force and uh, the chemical potentials, and uh, uh, the coarse grain entropy function in such a way that uh, all uh, the set of equations is uh, completely specified once uh, given the um, coarse grain entropy. So the problem of modeling uh, the system uh, reduces to the problem of modeling this uh, coarse grain entropy function. Uh, to do this, uh, we uh, choose to consider the uh, total energy of the system to be equal to a part including the electrostatic energy, a part including the kinetic energy of the particles, of the mesoparticles, and then a contribution of the internal energy of each mesoparticle. Uh, assuming that uh, each mesoparticle is local, locally at the thermodynamic equilibrium, uh, we can uh, relate the internal energy with uh, the entropy of uh, the mesoparticle and then, uh, assuming that the coarse grain entropy is the sum of uh, all the entropies of the particles composing the system, uh, we obtain an expression for the coarse grain entropy in which uh, the only terms uh, yet to specify are the electrostatic uh, potential energy and uh, the Helmholtz free energy of the system. For what concerns the electrostatic, the electrostatic energy, um, we considered uh, the uh, charge of each particle to be uh, distributed as a Gaussian of uh, fixed uh, variance. Uh, and so uh, the electrostatic energy is just uh, a, a sum of pairwise terms arising from uh, interaction of uh, Gaussian charge distributions. For what concerns instead the 
uh, Helmholtz free energy of the system. Um, it is, in principle, depends on uh, uh, the number of uh, particles composing the system, the system of each uh, species. For example, if we have uh, solved uh, one cationic species and one anionic species, we have three uh, type of particles, then the volume of uh, the mesoparticle and the temperature. So we had to do some uh, um, assumption on this. Uh, on first hand, we um, consider the volume uh, to, uh, of the mesoparticle uh, to be computed by uh, summing a, a kernel function over all the nearby particles. So somehow counting uh, the, the particles uh, near the uh, particle i. And this is the inverse of the volume of particle i. On the other hand, for what concerns the uh, number of particles, uh, we assumed that even if the mesoparticles can ex exchange uh, the underlying uh, microparticles, um, the total number of uh, particles, uh, solvent, cation, and anions, is uh, a constant of uh, the, the set of equations, which uh, is term m. Uh, on the other, uh, last thing, uh, we considered uh, the temperature to be uh, uniform in all the mesoparticles. So this model doesn't count for uh, temperature uh, gradients. In this way, uh, we could write the uh, Helmholtz free energy of particle I as a function only of uh, um, variables of state variables of the system, which are the number of cations, number of anions, and positions of the particle. Uh, so, summarizing, uh, the dynamics uh, of the system is completely uh, specified once uh, uh, model the uh, coarse grain entropy, so which means once uh, uh, given an equation of state for the uh, free energy. And um, the parameters gamma, which uh, are related to the corresponding uh, sigma parameters of the stochastic terms via the fluctuation dissipation uh, relations, control the transport coefficient. So specifically viscosity and the mobility of uh, the cation and anions. So the last step we did was uh, the validation of the model. So the model was implemented in uh, the LAMPS uh, software. Uh, we chose an electrodynamic system which has uh, analytical solution. Uh, we chose the microscopic model of the fluid, the equation of state, and uh, simulated the system comparing to the analytical solution. Uh, so, specifically, we um, simulated uh, the electrosmotic flow uh, of a fluid confined between two charged uh, parallel plates. We used uh, the free energy of uh, a perfect gas and so applied an electric field parallel to the walls to generate an electrosmotic flow. This uh, uh, slide shows the uh, concentration profile for two setups we uh, tried. So one is the anti-symmetric setup in which uh, the walls have uh, uh, are a charge of equal magnitude but opposite sign. One is the symmetric setup in which both walls are equally charged. And uh, you can see uh, on the top the ion concentration uh, uh, profiles uh, and of course the uh, ions of uh, uh, each sign accumulate near the wall uh, with the uh, opposite side, sign, and uh, the uh, ion concentration profile is uh, in very good agreement with uh, the analytical prediction. This uh, is the equilibrium situation, let's say, then we applied uh, an electric field and measured the velocity profile of the fluid. Uh, in both cases, anti-symmetric uh, uh, charge, wall charge or symmetric wall charge. Uh, so in, uh, in both cases, we measure the profile and find a very good agreement with the um, analytical uh, prediction. Uh, in the case of anti-symmetric wall charge, uh, there is the average velocity of the profile is uh, zero, and while in the case of uh, symmetric wall charge, uh, we have uh, a net motion of, uh, of the fluid due to the electric field. So concluding, uh, this model can be used to simulate uh, uh, charged fluids uh, in um, confined uh, systems. Uh, the fluid model can uh, be, uh, 
can be tuned specifying different equations of state and the uh, viscosity and ionic conductivity can be calibrated changing the uh, parameters gamma, which is the, the, the dissipative uh, constant. Uh, the model has been uh, implemented in LAMPS and validated with, uh, sim by simulating a planar electrosmotic flow. Uh, some future work uh, uh, on this topic could be to simulate the electrosmotic flow in uh, a more uh, complex geometry. Uh, also include uh, a more complex equation of state, such as, for example, Van der Waals. And uh, also, uh, it is possible to extend the model to include the, uh, to explicitly include the polarizability of the, of the fluid. Uh, possible applications uh, of this uh, model could be in uh, fields where uh, um, the char of nanofluidics, where the charges are uh, uh, important, so in, uh, for example in nanopore sensing uh, or uh, in uh, hydrophobic uh, uh, gating. So thank, I want to thank uh, my PhD advisors Mauro Pinatti and Carlo Massimo Carciola and as well the Highgate group uh, led by Alberto Giacomello um, which I'm now working with. Thank you also. Let's thank our speaker. Uh, we have Time for a couple of questions. Yes. Questions. I have one quick question. The um, yes. the forms uh, that you had with the hyperbolic functions; those were the analytic solutions on the previous slide. Is that correct? Yes, they were analytic solutions in uh, linearized analytic solutions, really. So under um, the assumption of a low um, ch charge of the walls. Okay, and those are the solid lines and the dotted yes. lines. Are, okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Can I ask something? Absolutely. Thanks for the presentation. I was wondering Thank how you. to use the boundaries um, and what happens in the boundaries in terms um, yeah. towards the screening of the charge. Because I say, I guess if you if you look at diffuse of small, uh, sorry, electrosmosis, then then you care a lot about what happens on the boundary. Yeah. Yes, that, that's very true. In, in fact, the boundary are composed by. Um, same kind of particle as uh, the fluid, but uh, of course uh, fixed and with a fixed charge, and uh, which have uh, this kind of uh, dissipative interaction, which uh, ensures uh, uh, a no-slip uh, condition. So ah, somehow okay. they, they drag the, the, the fluid. So you um, make sure basically that you will have no-slip? Yes, yes, uh, measured with uh, um, uh, walls which were not charged, and just uh, doing a uh, applying a pressure and uh, possible flow. Okay. So, yes. And did you measure the viscosity or is it? Yes, yes. In, in fact, it's, the viscosity is not uh, an input of the model. It can be tuned, but it has to be measured. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's thank our speaker again. And um, we'll go on to the, the final talk of the session. Um, I have my Cojelho Araujo and Pelo de Gama from the University of Lisbon. The title of the talk is Propagation of Interfaces and Active Pneumatics. The presenter will be Rodrigo Coelho. Professor, uh, hi everyone. Good afternoon. Um, are you seeing my screen? <coughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, let me... Okay. So, um, in this work, I'm going to present uh, about our recent study on the propagations of interfaces in active pneumatics, more specifically um, about um, interfaces in swarming bacteria, as I will explain. Um, so, 
let me hide this. So um, active liquid crystals, uh, just to introduce a few, uh, few concepts, um, are mostly living systems uh, <clears throat> in which uh, we have elongated particles, densely packed, and, and they are able to extract the energy from their env environment and convert it into a directed motion. So examples are um, colonies of bacteria, of elongated bacteria, which are densely packed. Uh, even microscopic systems are, as shoes of fish. Uh, one very used uh, uh, system uh, for, for studying active pneumatics are the mixtures of uh, microtubule kinesin, as you can see on the left on this video. They form this uh, very complex um, flow uh, known as active turbulence in contrast with the, the passive turbulence, which is, occurs for a high Reynolds number. In this case, uh, the active turbulence occurs for low Reynolds number. Um, so uh, this name, active liquid crystals, come from, from uh, the passive liquid crystals, which uh, are very used in, in uh, display technologies. So they are composed of uh, elongated molecules, uh, which uh, they receive this name because uh, liquid crystals, because they can flow like a liquid, but can they are still ordered uh, in a crystal-like way. So, um, so they can be in two main phases. Uh, in the pneumatic phase, uh, <clears throat> which is ordered, you have uh, a preferential alignment for the directors. Or in the isotropic phase, in which uh, the, the directors point in random directions. So in, in this study, we use a multi-phase model um, in, uh, with an interface between these two phases. So you have uh, a, coexist a coexistence between pneumatic and isotropic phase with an interface. So uh, to model the, the active liquid crystals, we use uh, essentially the, the same model used for passive liquid crystals uh, with an extra term, which is the active stress in the Navier-Stokes equation, I'll show in the next slide. So this slide is the same, uh, the theory is the same for passive liquid crystals we use. Uh, we solve two equations together, they are coupled. The Bellis edwards equation, uh, it's solved with um, finite difference. And the Navier-Stokes equation is solved with let's Boltzmann. So we actually implement the, the Boltzmann equation and we could recover the Navier-Stokes equation in the microscopic limit. Um, these two are, I, discre uh, I discretize it, use the same discretization for, for its space. Uh, the same grid you use for let's go to use for finding difference, it's uh, easier. And um, the best edge equation we can see uh, below, um, it's based on the min minimization of the free energy, of the landau de Gange free energy, uh, which has two, uh, we can separate in two terms. This term F1 is uh, the book free energy, it, is, it gives the, the phase transition uh, between a matic and isotropic phase, which regulates the, the transition is this parameter gamma. Uh, in our case, this will be in the coexistence value. Right? Um, and the second term is the elastic term. It, it penalizes distortions. So the Navier-Stokes equation uh, is almost the standard one, but with uh, some terms from the liquid crystal theory as this, um, as this uh, pi alpha beta is given here. It's totally, um, it's exactly the same using for passive, uh, for in the passive case. It has two new, new terms, which I'd like to call your attention. The first one is the friction term. It, um, because in our case, uh, we have bacteria on a substrate, so they have friction um, with the media. And a second term in green is the, the active stress. So it has a parameter zeta, which regulates the strength of the activity. In our case, it will be always uh, positive, meaning that you have only extensile systems or pullers, puller particles. But you could also model uh, pusher particles um, with negative values for zeta. This, is, uh, this depends how is the flow around uh, the domain or the particles. So um, our motivation for this work, for this particular work, uh, was a, a quite recent study published in 2018. Um, 
it, uh, where the authors um, studied the propagation of interface in swarming bacteria. The bacteria uh, are the Serracha marcensis, the scientific name, and the uh, they are slightly elongated, so that's why I, I thought we could be modeled with a liquid crystal model. And um, they are densely packed, as you can see in this uh, pink um, figure. And they, to make the, the interface, they, they kill the bacteria for uh, inside a certain domain, for, for us uh, using uh, ultraviolet light. So for a circular uh, interface, I'll show in the next slide. You can see here the, the velocity field. Um, initially, they have um, a turbulent state or chaotic. Uh, they apply the, the ultraviolet light in this circular domain or octagonal, uh, killing the bacteria inside. So we see that the velocity in this region is zero. That's why uh, we have a passive active uh, interface. And they studied the, the, this propagation. So in this particular case, they, they analyzed the, ta the closing time. Um, they also investigate um, a flat interface, as you can see here in the velocity field. Um, it, uh, they kill the bacteria on the top part and allows uh, and so the, the propagation. We see that it goes up and with uh, approximately the same interface width. Um, so uh, whenever I, I talk about um, experiments, um, I mean, referring to this uh, particular paper that I, I gave the, the reference before. So here are um, results from from our simulations, uh, in which we simulate the, the circular interface first. Um, in, on the left, we see uh, the order parameter, in which the red represents the pneumatic order, and the, the blue is the, the isotropic, uh, the isotropic uh, phase. And uh, <clears throat> we try to mimic the, the conditions in the experiment. Initially, we have a chaotic state. Then we set the, the, a circular uh, domain with isotropic fluid, um, isotropic phase. And we see on the right in the velocity field that the, um, that the velocity is zero uh, inside this isotropic domain. So that's our way to simulate uh, an, um, um, uh, an active passive domain uh, interface. So we also simulate a flat interface. Uh, you see that it's going up. Um, it goes actually with a constant velocity and with a constant interface width, and we will describe more later. And uh, first, uh, we try to um, to characterize our model, to see if it's minimally reasonable to uh, when we compare with statistical quantities from the experiment. So here are measurements from the experiments uh, of Serracha Marcensis. It was not done by us, was in this reference paper. Um, they, they have studied the velocity distribution, which has this uh, maxwell boltzmann uh, distribution. Uh, they have measured the special and time correlation functions. Uh, for the vorticity field. And um, uh, what I, I think is more interesting is the, the energy spectrum, because we can, uh, because uh, because they follow two power laws, which you can um, compare uh, from our simulations. So, so uh, it has an increasing range. It's different from the passive turbulence. Right? Uh, it has an increasing range uh, in which the, the particle injects uh, energy in the, the fluid. And um, <clears throat> and uh, decreasing range uh, with a power law minus h30, uh, in which uh, the energy dissipates in the system. So uh, from, these are results from our simulations. Uh, since it's easy for us, we can uh, change the, the activity. Um, we see that the, the velocity distribution has the same uh, profile. It's a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. It has different distributions for different activities. Uh, we analyze here five uh, specific uh, activities. And um, the special correlation function, uh, it is also different for each uh, activity, but it's nicely collapsed when we divide the, the distance by the active length. The expression for the active length is given here. It, it's, find, uh, it's found uh, by the, the balance between the, the elastic force and the 
uh, in the active forces. Um, so it, it has a scaling law. Um, I mean, this uh, special correlation function and uh, the time autocorrelation could be used, uh, could be compared with the experimental ones to, to, to uh, convert from let's units to, um, to physical units. Right? Uh, because it gives the, the average size of the, the vortices. Um, the energy spectrum, so we compare with these two power laws, it increases with uh, 5 thirds and decreases with minus 8 thirds, so it's uh, reasonable, uh, it's not too far at least. Uh, even the experiment is not conclusive that uh, the power laws are exactly these ones. Um, it can be slightly different. In our case, um, it, it seems more or less the same. So it, it's not too far at least. Uh, we think you can use this to, to make predictions uh, uh, on the propagation of interfaces in swarming bacteria, at least for this one, for the Serrachimar census. Um, so um, one predict, uh, we, we wanted to, uh, com to study the closing time for a circular interface uh, as a function of the activity, because uh, in the experiment they usually have just one activity, but uh, in this particular experiment at least, but they could change uh, by changing the, the concentration of nutrients, uh, by changing the, the, the oxygen and so on. Um, but they, they cannot measure or uh, it, it's not usual to, to measure activity. Here uh, with this um, relation, uh, experimentalists could uh, at least estimate the, the activity in the system. They, they just make a, um, a circular interface and measure the time it takes to close. So we find that the, the closing time uh, decays quadratically with the activity. Uh, for a flat interface, uh, we observed that the interface width uh, is constant in time in agreement with the experiment, you see here. Um, the velocity uh, increases with the tipped as expected. But here is an, a different, um, an important difference. Um, why in the experiment the velocity uh, reduces with time? Uh, actually, the position of the interface uh, follows a, a square root of time function. Um, <clears throat> in our model, the the velocity is constant. Um, of a flat for a flat interface. Uh, this is uh, a limitation of our model because we are using a multi-phase model. Right? Uh, the isotropic phase could be uh, converted into the pneumatic phase and the total amount of activity in the system is not conserved. While uh, in the experiment, um, the total amount of live bacteria uh, or, or died bacteria uh, is constant. <clears throat> so with time, the, the passive bacteria are being diluted in the active domain and the system becomes less active. Uh, that's why the, the interface uh, goes slower with time, slower. Um, so here is a difference to, to keep in mind and can be fixed in, in future works. It's just a starting point. Um, we studied the structure factor of the interface. Uh, this is essentially the, the Fourier transform of the interface position, so it takes into account the fluctuation. And um, in the experiment, they they compared with uh, with the equilibrium value for um, for for interface uh, subjected to thermal fluctuations only. Uh, it should follow a minus two power law. Um, this comes from the partition function. Uh, we observed that it's not too far from this uh, power law, but if you look carefully or if you measure the, the slopes, uh, we see that it actually changes a bit with the activity. So, uh, and this is reasonable because um, our system is not in equilibrium. Uh, should, uh, we should have differences um, between uh, uh, an interface for an equilibrium system and, uh, and a swarming, bac uh, swarming bacteria. Um, another prediction uh, from, from this model, uh, using our uh, model, is that, uh, well, first we try to, uh, to stop an interface. Uh, with a global change in the friction, uh, we could have, uh, we just uh, um, 
we don't have a propagating interface. We cannot stop with a global change in friction. But with a, a gradient of friction, if you have a lower friction here um, on the bottom and a higher friction on the top, the interface uh, stops in between. And uh, the position where it stops depends on the activity. So we have measured um, the, the threshold of friction for each the, the interface can still propagate. So below this threshold, the, the interface propagation, above this with a global change, um, we have that the pneumatic domain shrinks and the, the, uh, the system becomes isotropic. So to conclude, um, we have tested the, the, the applicability uh, of a multi-phase model for, li for active liquid crystals to this system of swarming bacteria compared uh, with this experiment, uh, experimental study, um, which is a nature communication I showed before. And um, we observed that it actually reproduced many statistical proportions of this uh, system. So uh, it's a good starting point, but it has limitations due to the non-conserving order parameter. So the total amount of equilibrium in the system, uh, of activity in the system is not, um, constant. And uh, we could improve this in future works using a multi-component model, for instance, implementing Cahill equation or using advection diffusion of activity. So if you want to find out more, uh, you can uh, check our publication, it, the reference is given here, or you can contact me to, uh, if, uh, after this presentation um, through email or Skype. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Let's thank our speaker. Um, you. We have time for questions. Questions? Let me ask one because I want to make sure I understand the experimental setup. Mm -hmm. Initially, the entire thing is filled with the bacteria, but then you use ultraviolet light to kill off like a particular pattern. Exactly. Yes. So initially you have, uh, let me show here. Um, they have the same shape. It's just that one are moving under their own will to the extent that bacteria have will, and the other ones are dead and just moving around, is that? So, um, yeah, let me present here. Um, yeah, and initially you have this chaotic state, yeah. and they, are, they apply the ultraviolet light, uh, and they say that the, the bacteria are passivated, <laughs> but that's uh, an euphemism, right? they, they are died. Uh, <laughs> They, they can actually um, to this one uh, the bacteria in this domain um, they are died and with time uh, these died bacteria are being diluted in the this active, active domain so um, uh, but they, they don't they don't um, become active with time. So that's why for a flat interface, uh, we have that the velocity reduced with them because uh, the activity per area, or let's say, it's, uh, it reduces. The living ones move upwards and the, um, the dead ones just sort of diffuse into the living ones. Is that the right picture? Yes, yes. Okay, so then getting to the real question, as to whether this is a conserved or non-conserved order parameter. <laughs> is it, um, um, well, if it, if it were non-conserved, you would expect a, a time separation of t to the one half. But if I'm remembering correctly, if it's conserved, you would expect t to the one third, right? But you don't get either of those. Uh, sorry, uh, I didn't uh, understood. Well, I, I may be not remembering correctly, but if if you have, this is the difference between 
the Halperin and Hohenberg model, I'm forgetting my letters here, model H, mm -hmm. conserved order parameters, like for example, phase separation of oil and water, mm -hmm. versus for example, uh, Ising magnetization, which would be a non-conserved order parameter. Mm -hmm. I thought that, um, um, I thought that, that in one case, the phase separation, the characteristic domain size grew as t to the one half, and in mm -hmm. the other case, it was t to the one third. Mm -hmm. But I'm not an expert in this area, and if somebody else wants to jump in, feel free. I do see. Um, I actually, uh, I, I think uh, I didn't measure this, um, how the domain size grew. Uh, but yeah, maybe this, uh, well, this, uh, this measurement from the experiment, yeah. um, they have, uh, they expect, or at least they, they fit this curve, that the, the interface position goes with the, the square root of time. This would ah. be the expected for a diffusive uh, process. Okay. So okay. they, they expect that the total amount of, of activity uh, is constant. But it's uh, it, it's diffusive. Yeah. It's if you, so you you do see something close to the t to the one half. T to the yes uh, no in my case no <laughs> it's uh, it's linear uh, it's just uh, t okay. because uh, yeah the, the propagation is linear but in the experiment they they claim that it's diffusive. Ah okay. Ah very interesting okay. Good. Other questions? Uh, if there's no other questions, let's thank our speaker and let's thank all of the speakers in the session. And, and that concludes technical session two. Um, and um, that's all I have on the schedule for today. So thank you all for your participation.